Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. My name is Stephanie Levine. I'm a policy analyst at the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning, or CMAP, as I'll probably say for the rest of the evening. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about a tool we developed that helps users explore Rebuild Illinois, which is the capital infrastructure, infrastructure package passed by the state this past summer. Um, I'll talk a bit about some other planning data we have and that we make available to the public, and just in general, what we're doing at CMAP to improve access to public information. Um, before I get going, if you'll indulge me, who here has heard of CMAP before? Awesome. Has anyone used our data or our research in your own work before? Cool, even better. Um, that helps me. Uh, I'll perhaps skip over some of the background or be a bit briefer then. When I start out and talk about CMAP and our region's long range plan on to 2050, um, I'm then going to give a really brief overview of Rebuild Illinois and some of the components that are in the $45 billion capital infrastructure package, talk a bit about how we developed our searchable tool, talk a bit about um, considerations. If you've used it, we put it out um, into the world in August, so maybe you've downloaded it before and have um, been searching for projects and programs, or if you plan on using it, things to consider some analysis we've done since we've developed the tool, and then um, just briefly show you some other data sets that I think might be of interest to folks here tonight. So CMAP is the region's comprehensive regional planning agency. Um, we work within the seven county uh, Chicago metro area. We are statutorily required by both state and federal law. We are mostly federally funded. Um, the primary function of a regional trans, uh, planning agency is to implement strategies for transportation, um, but at CMAP we go beyond that. We're looking at transportation and how it intersects with land use, housing, the environment, and a lot of other quality of life topics. Um, as a regional planning agency, we're interested in the growth and success of the region, not just the urban core. We recognize that transportation and other infrastructure systems don't stop at municipal boundaries, right? Um, this often means that we have to build consensus um, between urban, suburban, and rural interests because the geography of the seven county region is really varied. So our main functions, um, we strive to make the Chicagoland area more competitive by guiding public investments wisely. We program most of the federal transportation dollars that come into the Chicago region. The needs of the transportation system, as I'm sure everyone knows, are, are really great um, in, in our region, and we want to make sure that every dollar that's invested is going to the best possible project with the, the most impact for the region. We enhance quality of life by trying to make travel um, more seamless, safer, and less congested. And then we also support local planning. So we have a lot of planners at CMAP that work with local units of government, municipalities, counties, other interjurisdictional entities to produce planning products. So this could be um, bike and trail plans, maybe it's a comprehensive zoning plan. Um, but the, the plans all work to implement the strategies of our region's long range plan. So just to set the stage a little bit, our region today, um, we're working in the seven county region. Um, within the seven counties, Chicago is just one of the 284 municipalities. There's 8.5 million residents. As far as transportation assets, we have about 30,000 miles of road, 7,200 miles of transit routes, uh, 1,200 bike trail miles, a lot of assets to operate and maintain, and a lot of different entities that are operating and maintaining those assets. Um, frankly, our assets are aging. As they age, it becomes more expensive to operate and maintain them, and it creates barriers for residents all throughout the region. Um, and that's what our long-range plan onto 2050 addresses through a lot of different topic areas. So we look at mobility and development and land use. Um, onto 2050 was adopted uh, last year by our board of directors. It was the result of a really extensive period, a three-year period of research and public outreach. We held hundreds of public events. We talked to thousands of residents across the region. Um, we published dozens and dozens of policy papers and briefs. All of the policy recommendations in ONTU 20, ONTU 2050 are data-driven. That's how we do our policy development. So ONTU 2050 is guided by three principles. Uh, the first is inclusive growth, growing the economy through opportunity for all. Um, by many measures, race and ethnicity are barriers to success in this region, and in order to advance the region, we need to address these disparities. And so that sort of underpins all of the policy recommendations and onto 2050. 
Resilience, we want to prepare for rapid change, both known and unknown. So not just in our transportation system, but also making sure our neighborhoods are adaptable as well. And then the, the final principle is prioritized inv investment. Um, as I mentioned, we want to make sure we're using public dollars wisely and making sure that we're using um, supported metrics to choose which projects move forward. So in ONTO 2050, depending on your policy area of choice, I'm sure you can find some topic areas that are of interest to you. I'm going to hone in on one recommendation from our governance chapter tonight, um, and that is to improve access to public information through technology and transparency. Um, this recommendation is addressed at all of our government partners. We work with government partners from the federal level all the way down to you know, the smallest units of local government in the region. Um, but when it comes to uh, improving access to data, we try to lead the way at CMAP and be a good example for what we would want out of our partners. Um, and I think we do a pretty good job on it. So if you go to the Google Doc tonight, I linked to our data hub. On our data hub, you'll find more than 500 unique data sets that we've developed at CMAP um, that span all of those topic areas. I'm going today to dive into one of our more recent projects. So a uh, recent project we did on Rebuild Illinois. Um, but I think it sort of demonstrates, um, you know, the type of work we're doing around this topic area. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the program and then talk about the tool we, tool we built. <laughs> so as you can tell, we're proud of all of our assets across the region. Um, we're really interested to see what will come out of the $45 billion capital package that was passed. So in late June and early July, um, the General Assembly and the Gov uh, enacted and the governor signed the, the Rebuild Illinois program. It is not just a list of projects and programs, it also creates a lot of new revenues to support those projects and programs. It's the first time we've had a capital program in Illinois since 2009. It's the first time that we've increased the state gas tax in 29 years. And it's um, also the first time that the state has created ongoing dedicated funding for transit capital. So this is also something um, that's really important to the region, getting that ongoing funding for transit. It's a significant investment in multimodal transportation, but beyond transportation, it's a really big investment in public facilities, open space, uh, affordable housing, a really broad spectrum of projects and programs um, in the bill. So as far as new transportation revenues, there's $2.8 billion um, in new revenues annually at full implementation. So these will come from a few different sources. Um, we have the increase to the state gas tax, the motor fuel tax. Um, it's also indexed to inflation for the first time. So this has been a longstanding recommendation of CMAP and many of our partners. Um, we wanna make sure that as the cost of operating and maintaining our transportation system grows, that the revenues grow alongside it. Um, we also have a number of increases to registration fees, so passenger vehicles, trucks, electric vehicles, all will pay more. There's also a number of increases to some random fees like titling fees at the Secretary of State's office, um, among other things. So the transportation dollars will go to the transportation programs. There's also a number of other new revenue sources in Rebuild Illinois that will fund infrastructure. Um, there is a really significant expansion of gaming, casinos, and the legalization of sports betting. Um, we also have some new taxes, a new state parking tax, an increase to the cigarette tax, um, as well as uh, certain sales taxes which will now be applied to online purchases. Um, and the thing I'll just say about these types of revenues for infrastructure is that they're much riskier than some of the user fees when it comes to transportation. Um, betting on things like new casinos, for example, we all know there's a lot of siting considerations for the new casino in Chicago. Um, and betting on those revenues on a certain timeline, um, they may not materialize as you expect. So these are just like really high level of the, the revenues. Um, if this is the kind of thing you're interested in, I would point you to some memos that I linked in the Google Doc. We've done a lot more in-depth analysis on the new revenues and done a lot of financial projections, um, which are linked there. But I'm gonna switch over now to talk about the projects and programs that'll be funded by these new revenues. So here I have the capital appropriations by project type. Um, transportation infrastructure is in orange and then it's uh, the other infrastructure, anything that's not transportation, is in green. 
So this came from some of the analysis we did as we started looking at the projects and programs and rebuild. Um, and there's essentially sort of three types of appropriations in the bill. So there are certain really broad buckets of funds that will be provided to state agencies and the agencies will manage and it will be at their discretion how projects are selected um, and where those projects will be across the state. So you'll see I refer to some statewide projects and programs and those are the projects and programs we really don't know where the money will be going towards. Um, we also have really large transportation projects where the, the facilities or the highway or the expressway is explicitly, explicitly stated in the bill. So um, those, you know, will say the exact location and we know where that money will be going. And then we also have other um, much smaller uh, grants to units of local governments and nonprofit um, and civic organizations. And we also have the specific um, grant recipient for those listed in the bill. So we have a spectrum of the types of programs that we know exactly where the money's going, and then um, some of these broader buckets of funds where there's still quite a bit of uncertainty. So you can see in the bottom corner here, I have a, a category called unspecified infrastructure. And those are those broad buckets of funds. Some of them could be used for transportation, so they might shift over to the orange side, but we just don't really have that information now. Um, for the folks in the room that are sort of maybe transportation adjacent or in, interested in infrastructure and maybe have been looking at rebuilds when it was passed in the summer, uh, my guess would be that this might be one of the, the more granular breakdowns of the bill that you've seen. Um, and that's because the bill in its current form is really difficult to use. So even though this is a pretty simple pie chart, um, or I guess it's a donut chart because those look nicer than pie charts and you're not supposed to use pie charts. Um, it's probably the hardest pie chart I've ever made, and that's because this is what the bill looks like. So the bill is a 362-page PDF document. It has um, almost all of the appropriations from Rebuild are in this one bill. The package is a suite of legislation, so there's other legislation that deal with the revenues and the bonds, but these are just the appropriations. So um, for the rest of the evening when I talk about Rebuild, I'm going to be talking about this one public act um, that has 1,400 line item appropriations in it. Um, it's text searchable though, so you could do some searches on keywords if you wanted to, but that's not really useful to answer the types of questions and um, do the kinds of summaries that we wanted to do at CMAP. So when the capital package was passed, um, we started thinking about what are, what's the kind of information we want to be able to glean from a document like this that has all of the appropriations in it. And as a regional agency, we are very curious about how much money will be coming to the region. But in its current form, that was nearly impossible to do without going through and control F on, I don't even know if you could keyword anything to do that. You'd have to go through each individual appropriation. Um, things like how much money will come to transit or how much money is gonna be invested in community colleges. Those are just the types of things you'd have to do a bunch of keyword searches, hope that you captured all the right keywords, hope there were no typos in the bill, and maybe you would have a number that sort of gave you an idea of what those appropriations would be like. Um, so that wasn't exactly how we wanted to do our analysis. We talked about maybe having an intern uh, take this and do a bunch of copy and pasting and making a spreadsheet. What we really wanted was a spreadsheet that we could sort and filter and maybe tag by geography. So as we started to look in it, into it a little bit further, um, it sort of became clear that the way the appropriations were written were very formulaic. And so um, it seems like maybe there was a more automated way we could do this. So here on the screen, I know it's probably impossible to read, uh, but I have three sort of random appropriations I took from the bill. Um, the first is for a park district facility at Lyon Park. Um, second is for repairs at the Green Line Cottage Grove Station. And then we also have one of those larger buckets of funds for affordable housing. So different articles throughout the bill, but they all have some, some patterns uh, that distinguish them. So, Every appropriation starts with a section number. There's some more like linguistic patterns. They all have the appropriation number, but some, um, a key phrase. So these say the sum of $200 million or the sum of $60 million. Same thing for the bond fund. So they all are coming from different bond funds, but they have like these uh, phrases uh, preceding the fund. And then the same thing for the projects. There's a lot more variation in the type of project. Um, but it seemed like maybe we could automate a way to make the data table that we wanted to use and perhaps help our partners out as well. Um, just because the, the possibility for manual error if you're doing a lot of copying and pasting and trying to do that yourself um, just wasn't how we wanted to, to do this. 
So I read um, the PDF document into R using a PDF, packet, a PDF reader package. I will caveat all of my coding talk also by saying I'm, I'm, a, I'm a novice when it comes to these things. I learned how to use R this year. Um, but in the Google Doc, I've linked to our GitHub page, and we have the code that we used to translate this document. And essentially, by reading it in as a string and using all of those patterns, we could cut up the entire document into those appropriations. So it was definitely an iterative process. And if you're interested in the code and you're looking at it, you'll see a lot of my like trial and error um, ways of getting around to this. But my hope that by sharing this with everybody, even though I'm feeling you know, a little vulnerable sharing my code, is that we could take that and use it as inspiration for other legislation, other budgets, other policy. So the code that's in there today only works on this PDF. That was like basically the limit of my skills. Um, but I have, I'm totally optimistic that many people sitting in this room could take it and maybe write a more universal code um, and just continue on making policy like this that perhaps some folks hoped that we wouldn't have access to um, more accessible. So, the funny thing about using um, regular expressions and patterns to do something like this is that every time uh, something in the text didn't conform to what I was telling the, the script to do, I would get an error. So I was getting some funny errors. It turns out there were a lot of typos in the bill, like a lot of typos in the bill. Um, you can see some of them, like sometimes I would have to even embed that in the script, like there was a state department that was misspelled and I couldn't grab the name just because it was misspelled, so you'll see that in the script, which is, I don't know, kind of funny. Um, I don't want to belabor that point too much, but there are some like interesting things that come out of, uh, you know, the fact that this was a pretty hastily written bill. So for example, here I have an appropriation. Um, it's for gym improvements at a high school here in Chicago. But as far as like implementation of this bill goes, it's kind of an interesting legal interpretive question. Like, is this $100,000 with an extra comma, or is this a million dollars with a missing zero? Like, what's, what's the statutory uh, authority for this appropriation? Those are the kinds of things that we're hoping will maybe be fixed in a bill cleanup during the veto session, but we're just not sure. So before I dive into using the spreadsheet, um, I just want to make note of a few user considerations. Um, the first is that the spreadsheet of Rebuild is not CMAP's analysis of the capital program. It's a direct um, transcription of the legislation as it was when it was enacted. So that was um, an important decision that we made. We wanted to be able to provide the data in its most essential form, essentially so it just reflected the actual public act. Since we've put this out in August, others have done some similar database type searching. So the TRIB put out a database with rebuild projects last week. I'm not sure if anyone saw it. Um, but they made a different decision. So they didn't include some projects, and they ins included other projects that were not part of the package. So just decisions based on what you're trying to put out into the world. But that was how we approached this topic. Um, the other thing to remember is that Everything in the bill is just an appropriation. It's not a guarantee that the projects will move forward. And I just want to mention this because once you start digging into the projects and programs and get kind of like distracted by some of the wacky line items, because there's like some really wacky line items, um, it's hard to kind of keep this in context of like what an appropriation is, which is that it's just an authorization to spend the funds. It's not a guarantee that the program will move forward. So, all of the projects and programs could get delayed or eliminated for any number of reasons. Could be due to revenues that don't come in. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about how the bonds will be issued for these capital packages, uh, for the capital projects and programs. There's also a lot of agency processes that might need to be developed to manage the money. It's a huge, huge program. And some of these agencies just have never managed um, funds in this amount before. Again, I just want to um, point out there are these broad categories of funds that make it really hard sometimes to make high-level statements about where the money will be going. So I have just a couple of them. For example, um, the $200 million to the Illinois Housing Development Authority for affordable housing. We don't know what kinds of projects or programs that'll, that'll go to. There's tons of different affordable housing projects and programs managed by IHDA. Um, and similar for some of the economic development or wet wetland restoration, just those kinds of projects, um, we just don't know where that money will go until the managing agencies sort of make, make it uh, public on how, how they plan on administering those programs. So 
All that being said, uh, now the fun stuff, which for me is the analysis, it's not really the coding. Um, what did we find out once we turned rebuild into a searchable spreadsheet? So this was one of the first things I did um, after it became a data table. It was, I just made a pivot table, so a few clicks. And for the first time, we had all of the appropriations by, by fund and bond fund. Um, this was something that we were really interested in, particularly for appropriations that were coming out of the new funds. It's also notable, this was actually the first time that we had a total amount um, for what was in the bill. So the total you can see is $27.6 billion. Um, I went on, I erred on the conservative side for the question of the, uh, the high school gym, if it was a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. But um, with, with pretty good certainty, we can say this is the total state amount. And so you'll notice that that's different than 45 billion, which is the number we've been using. That's the number um, the governor's office had been using in talking about rebuild Illinois. And that's because 45 billion includes federal dollars as well and some local dollars. So this was the first time we definitively knew how much had been appropriated on the state side. Um, the next thing that I did, as I mentioned, we were really in interested in geography, um, was flag if it was in our region. So now that it was in a CSV format, I just opened it in Excel and I had all the Excel formulas I'm used to and I could use that on the data table. So I did a match against all the municipalities in the region and within a few hours after I cleaned the data a little bit, um, I could figure out something, it's not quite showing up here, but you can, so the colors are oranges downstate, Gray is statewide, and blue is northeastern Illinois. Um, so the labels got a little messed up, but you can see that the bike ped all the way on the left side of all of the bike ped, ped excuse me, pedestrian uh, projects, almost all of them were slated for grantees in northeastern Illinois um, to varying degrees across other different um, topic areas. And then we also have um, I believe this is broadband and this is affordable housing. So those are the categories where appropriations were only made statewide. Um, and I should mention I did the same thing with these topic areas. So these are the same topic areas that we were looking at in the pie chart earlier. Um, so it was also the first time that we had that breakdown um, at a much granular level of where the funds were going to um, based on geography and the topic area. Just another example, oh, my labels. Um, so another example of things we were interested in, we have folks that do a lot of economic development at the community and local level at CMAP. Um, they are interested in investment in community colleges. So I was presenting a similar um, presentation to them the other day and I was like, oh, I wonder how much was um, set aside for community colleges in Northeastern Illinois. And using our data table, it took me like maybe 10 minutes max to just match against all the name of all the community colleges and find out that, so on the left side, that's the City Colleges of Chicago, it's 28 million. Uh, <laughs> the center bar is all of the other community colleges in Northeastern Illinois, and then we have our statewide funds that might be available to community colleges as well. So these are just the types of questions that were coming up in our daily work at CMAP that we are now able to answer really quickly compared to what we were doing before, which were those text searches. As we go forward, we're pretty optimistic about what this will help us do as we look retroactively at this capital package. Maybe it won't be 10 years before the next one, um, but when that time comes, I think it'll be helpful to be able to track better how the, the projects and programs, um, the bonds were issued and see sort of the spend over time. That's something we don't have a ton of information on in the last capital program. So what are our key takeaways from this project? Um, essentially, of course, we would like more transparency from the state if the state had um, given us and the public a nice spreadsheet with all the programs from the beginning. Uh, I probably wouldn't be here tonight talking about it, but here we are, I guess there's pros and cons to everything. Um, so the other thing it's been really useful for that I haven't really mentioned is verifying analysis that we saw floating around in the echo chamber. So whether it was um, numbers in the media or perhaps like email blasts from state partners or advocates. It was really nice to have a table that I could be like, okay, they're saying this much is uh, being set aside for that program, but I didn't think it matched what I had seen out of a few appropriations. And just being able to check those things for yourself has been really helpful for us. It's good generally for those high level summaries, like some of those topic areas we were looking at and also a good jumping point for more granular analysis. Um, but ultimately, it's not that useful for geographic comparisons because of those statewide funds that we still need to wait and see how those will turn out. So those are just some things to think about um, if it's going to be helpful to you and your work, if you plan on exploring it a little bit more. Um, 
I'm going to wrap up in just a minute, but before I do that, I just want to put a plug in for some of the other data products we have at CMAP. Um, it makes us really happy when people use our data. So if you do use our data, let us know. But you can find all of this on our data hub, which again is linked in the document. So this is something we're really excited about that we just um, released about a month ago. It's a regional sidewalk inventory. So it's a shapefile that has every road in the seven county region coded, um, whether it has sidewalk on one, both, or no sides of the street. We think this is gonna be really helpful for local municipalities, um, community advocates. We're excited what others can do with it. Just as a brief preview of some things, I was kind of playing around with the data. You can do summaries um, on any geography you want, really. But So here I have the percent of streets with no sidewalk based on Chicago community area. You could look at disparities across the city or the region. I know there's probably some transit nerds in the room. If you wanted to look at sidewalk access by transit, you can do that. So this is a map I made that actually not uses uh, not one, but two unique CMAP data sets. So it uses our sidewalk inventory, but it also uses our par parcel-based housing inventory. So this is an uh, inventory we have that estimates the number of people living um, all in each parcel in the seven county region. So it's a huge data file, but really helpful for things like comparing sidewalk percentages to people living and working in an area. So the dots are all of the CTA rail stations, and based on sidewalk coverage within a half mile of the station, how that compares to the population and employment density of the area. Um, just some things to get you guys thinking about how you might be able to use it in your own work. We have non-transportation uh, data sets as well. This is a 30-year water demand forecast that we created for onto 2050. Um, it, it forecasts out to 2050 on residential withdrawals. We also have one for industrial. We have a lot of land use data. So here's something that we have in our data hub. It's regional park access, um, parks per pop acres per population. And another data product we have that might be useful is we have a lot of summaries of census data in nice, pretty formats. So we call these our community data snapshots. Um, we have downloadable PDFs for almost any geography in the region you might want. So we have counties, we have municipalities, we have the Chicago community areas. Um, and we just want you guys to think about these types of things. If you need some quick census summaries, um, you know you can go to our website and download any of these. And they get updated when the census is updated as well. So I'm excited to answer your questions. Um, we can. Mm. Uh, <laughs> this this uh, slide had a bunch of links where you can find us at CMAP, but a lot of those links are in the document. Um, I will say we have a weekly up, uh, weekly newsletter. If you sign up for our weekly newsletter, you can get updates on our policy updates uh, when we release new data. Uh, we're on all of the platforms, Twitter and things like that. Um, but basically, cmap.illinois.gov. That's where you can find almost anything I talked about today. Hey, so I saw in your data that there is 300 million and then another 100 million set aside for broadband. Um, when will we find out where that money is going to be distributed? I know that in the region we have a lot of broadband deserts, particularly in the south. Yeah, great question. So I don't know the answer to that, and I would also like to know the answer to that. Um, what I think what uh, using the tool allows us to do, though, is to track the managing agencies. So I know for that particular um, appropriation that you're talking about, that's managed through DCEO. So DCEO just put out a strategic plan. That might be a place to go look at and see if there's any more information um, for their, I think it's a five-year strategic plan. Um, but just tracking the updates that come out of the managing agency, that's probably how I would go about trying to track those down. Yeah. Hi, um, I actually attended one of these events earlier this year um, with the state senator where he presented. Okay. And um, he, yeah, he went, he was broad, those types of things. Um, he specifically called out 220 million going to PACE directly. It was, it was aside from the 4.7 billion for transit. Did you, were you, did you see that or? Yeah, so um, that's something that is pretty easy to find now that we have our spreadsheet. So you can, um, I believe, if you typed PACE in, you wouldn't find anything. If you typed in suburban bus division, maybe, that would probably pull up the PACE appropriation. So that's how they are legally referred to in there. Do you, CMAP, have any um, influence over their routes and um, decision making? I, and the reason why I ask is um, I did some work there. And I took the bus to the headquarters, and I could not find one person within headquarters that rode the bus. They all drove to work, 
and you go out into the communities, the regional communities, and you're, the frustration be, you know, from people with disabilities to people who don't have a car to, you know, it not being synced with the train. Does CMAP have any influence over that, or is um, that all agency driven? So as far as routes go, that, that's a PACE thing. We do work closely with our partners at PACE to look forward for more strategic planning. Um, we have a lot of uh, recommendations in our in ONTU 2050 in our long-range plan on how to support transit. Um, it's the backbone of the transportation system here, and that's really important to us. But as far as like day-to-day -day operations and route setting, that's not really something that we're yeah that we're involved in. And I just want to add a little note. I do know McHenry County is taking advantage of this broadband uh, capital. Okay. Oh, interesting. Thank yeah. you. I have kind of a wonky question, so I guess I'll give you an option to uh, two different ways of answering it. Uh, I'm kind of curious, like, uh, if you could talk a little bit about, like, how the decision was made, like, that writing the R script that you made was going to be the best route to get this information, and I guess you could speak to that either, like, more, like, personally, or also, like, the real question is kind of, like, what's the relationship like between, like, the state and CMAP in, like, advocating for, like, is it possible to get this sort of data-driven approach like baked in like earlier in the legislative process rather than like after the fact? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll start with the first part and I'll move to the second part. So I'm not sure there was a specific moment where like this R script is the best possible way uh, to move forward. I was, me and many others were very averse to trying to do it manually. That was just something we didn't want to do based on the possibility for manual error. Um, we had state partners that we knew that were doing that. So the accessibility thing was not just something we were contending with. A lot of our transportation partners, even partners at the state, also didn't have the kind of insight um, that we wanted. So after playing around, it seemed like it, we could do it in an automated way. And once it became a, a, in, within the realm of possibility, that's when we decided to move forward with it. Um, I also didn't want to ruin any intern summers. That would be like just a bad project for an intern to do. Um, as, far, as far as the, your second question, um, trying to encourage the state to have more transparency in how they put information out into the world. Um, it's a tough question. You know, we have a lot of state partners. I think some of our state partners feel the same way about technology and access to information as we do, and they don't all have the same resources to do projects like this. Um, it should be a baseline that these types of things are open and accessible to the public, and it's unfortunate that we're not, but I think the thing that surprised me the most was finding out how many um, other state partners were also seeking this information, and uh, I think we were just happy that we could provide that service ultimately, because once we started sharing it widely, we heard a lot of people saying, oh, awesome, like, this is, this is the, the format that I wanted it in. How, what is the process that you will be updating the information as further appropriations are approved? So as part of Rebuild Illinois, there won't be any further appropriations with just for, for this capital program. And that was also part of the reason we decided to simply do a transcription of the Public Act as it was enacted. Um, so I mentioned others have put um, cap uh, put together databases where you could search both capital and operational budgets. So that was the one the Tribune put out. Um, but of course, operational budgets change every year. So that was part of our deliberate decision to be like, okay, this is what we're putting into the world. And there really won't, as far as I can imagine, there wouldn't be a reason why we would update um, this unless there was, uh, you know, until there was a new capital program. A related question. Do you plan to track further how these funds will be used, allocated, approved, and so on? Yeah. In a separate way, what's the plan? So um, we're really interested in how the, the timing of how the bonds will be issued and how projects are selected. Um, based on the managing agency, it's just going to vary how much information we have. So we're already seeing some agencies like IDOT just put out their multi-year work plan. Um, we can identify that pro uh, specific projects in the work plan are from rebuild, but they might not identify the bond sources, for example. So it's really hard to match those up and track how much has been expended towards that total appropriation amount. 
Um, so as we move forward, I, it's something we're thinking about. I'm not sure how actively we'll be tracking it. I think we're going to be talking to our partners and perhaps find more at the local level, perhaps uh, the Council of Governments and Council of Mayors, the more sub-regional levels. It might be more appropriate for them to track the projects and programs in their areas um, rather than for us to do it at the seven, seven county uh, level. This is actually a, a related question too. Um, Similarly, you know, with tracking the, the bonds, was there also a possibility and interest in tracking the revenue sources that you had mentioned in terms of the gas tax and registration fees and kind of seeing, you know, what the actual um, increase in revenue is from those sources and are they actually allocated then to these projects? Yeah, so that's a much uh, or a relatively easier task to do because there's really good reporting out of the comptroller's office. So um, both from the Department of Revenue and the comptroller's office, there's much clearer reports that show the disbursements from those sources of revenue. Um, and that's something that we, we do intend to do and we've been um, anticipating very closely when we can start to see those reports, particularly from the motor fuel tax increase. Um, I think that's not something I do. One of my colleagues was looking at it. I, it may have already come out, um, but definitely a much easier task than tracking um, the issuance of the bonds and how they relate to the projects and programs on the revenue side, yeah. Would you happen to have any tote bags with uh, um, some more information that we could take home and so fun, in? So funny that you ask. Oh my, whoa. Over here in the corner, CMAP brought, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 tote bags that have the executive summary of ONTU 2050, which is the long range plan. They also have a nice calendar that we've developed, which is our annual report that you can put up in your cubicle or non-cubicle if you work in a place like this. Um, but they, if you guys don't take them home, they'll probably sit here. So please come take a tote bag. Um, and thanks for having me. I think yeah. that was probably. Yeah, thank you. Give it.